Your voice, your future. A 13 WAM News Town Hall, Police and Community Relations. Rising tension on the streets of America between police and the public. People have their hands up in the air right now. A spike in deadly encounters with suspects and officers losing their lives. A wave of protests nationwide from Ferguson to Baltimore. And in our own city here in Rochester, a dramatic protest downtown making headlines this summer. Officers coming under deadly fire in Dallas and across the country. More than 100 lost in the line of duty this year alone. Nothing justifies violence against law enforcement. Tonight, a chance for leaders to come together and push for a peaceful resolve. Your voice. Your future, a 13 WAM Town Hall, Police Community Relations. Good evening, I'm Don Alhart, and welcome to our 13 WAM Roundtable Discussion on Police and Community Relations. A chance really for local leaders and citizens to discuss some positive solutions to the problems we are sharing. On our panel tonight, Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren, Deputy Rochester Police Chief Wayne Harris, Rochester Police Union President Michael Mazio and the Reverend Lewis Stewart of the United Christian Leadership Ministry. And we also have live guests standing by downtown to join in our discussion tonight. And now we introduce our moderator for this evening, Mark Hyman. Thanks, Don. To protect and serve, it's an incredible responsibility. And every day across America, thousands of men and women in blue do just that, with honor and distinction. But it takes one unfortunate incident to undo all the goodwill. An arrest gone awry, a violent encounter, a tragic death. Good evening, I'm Mark Hyman, host of Behind the Headlines. Thank you at home for joining us. Police and community relations, tonight we talk about it and we look forward to your being a part of this. Well, thank you, my panel, for joining us this evening. We have a lot to go over tonight, so let's get right to it. Madam Mayor, I want to start off with you. According to the website NeighborhoodScout.com, an individual has a 1 in 262 chance of becoming a victim in New York City, but has a 1 in 199 chance of becoming a victim in Rochester. So there's a greater likelihood that an individual in Rochester could be a victim of crime. Why is that? Well, I think that you look at the area um and we are working very, very hard to make our community safer and to make our neighborhoods more vibrant and uh, to work with the community, our police department, as well as our clergy uh, and our citizens to make Rochester a safer place to, to live. Um, and, you know, when you look at the challenges that we face, some of it has to do with unemployment, some of it has to do with miseducation, some of it has to do with access to jobs, and that's why we are working very, very hard in the city of Rochester to change those outcomes, to make our neighborhoods safer, to make our educational system more effective for our children, and to work together with our community to uh, increase um, our, our safety for our police department as well as our citizens. Reverend, I want to bring in the conversation because the mayor said something that is very important. Oftentimes, people who look at these issues where there are violent encounters that, that go awry between police and local community, they think of it strictly in terms of a uniform and a citizen. I mean, there may be race involved, there may be other factors. But the mayor mentioned jobs, education. There are a number of factors that, that are part of this because they're all contributors. What are we missing when we look at this as, as a member of the public? What are we not considering that we should as to why there are challenges in Rochester and other cities around the country? Well, the mayor is right in her assessment, uh, but there are some other factors. Uh, there is the proliferation and uh, availability of guns, illegal guns, mm -hmm. uh, that must be interdicted, flowing into our community and must be stopped. Mm -hmm. there are, there's another factor, and that is the devaluation of human life. Why is it that many young people get so angry that they feel that they have to pick up a gun in order to kill someone, 
in terms of resolving an issue. And now we see what's on the uptake, not only the use of guns, but the use of knives. Um, we have a very real problem here that we've got to confront and that we've got to deal with. We've, we've got to get a handle on this or else this next generation uh, that we see is just going to de devolve into chaos. So I think it's up to all community citizens, everyone, police, community, clergy, every community stakeholder to do what we can in the way that we can in order to resolve these horrendous issues. I've had four people in my family over the years uh, killed, decimated due to gun violence. And I'm not the only one or family member that has gone through this. So certainly it's a problem. And I, don't, I want to stay with you for just a moment, Reverend, because there is the act itself. But let's take a step back. You're a member of the clergy. Mm -hmm. You've been a member of the clergy for a number of years. You mentioned the devaluation of life. It's certainly, it's a moral issue. Mm -hmm. It's a faith issue. Mm -hmm. It's a community standards issue. And certainly in our culture, we don't believe in taking life unnecessarily. How do we backtrack? Can we return to a time that may have perhaps been a little more innocent where we have a greater value of life? You cannot go back into the past. That's impossible. But what we can do is forge ahead into the future. There are so many people in our community, and this is everywhere. It's not just the black community, the Hispanic community, but it's also the white community. It's everywhere that I've noticed are without faith, are without any spiritual values, without any spiritual connection. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is that way, but there's quite a big sector of our people who are that way, who are disconnected from the church, who are disconnected from spirituality. And I think it, it, it falls on us who are clergy members to build that bridge and to get young people, to involve them, to, to, to engage them, and to lead them across this chaos, this nihilism, that this despair that is engulfing our community. Because the fact is, uh, uh, what displaces faith is despair. What displaces faith is also fear. How do we bridge that gap? Chief, the Reverend mentioned despair, and, and we certainly don't want to portray our nation as falling into this big dystopian future. But having said that, you have so many men and women in uniform working in communities throughout the Rochester, the city of Rochester. How do we engage young people today and, and instill in them a sense that there is a brighter future, or there should be a brighter future, there could be a brighter future, so they don't look with what goes on in their surroundings with despair? Well, I think that's a good question. <clears throat> I think that um, what gets uh, noticed the most is when officers step out in an arrest capacity or law enforcement capacity. Um, but I think as we move forward with developing our relationship and continuing our relationship with the community, programs like um, project tips, programs like the Police Activities League where we're engaging with the community um, in, in efforts like reading to the kids in elementary schools or going uh, doing shop with the cop. Programs Empowered. like that, I'm sorry? Teen Empowerment. Teen, teen Empowerment is another one. In fact, uh, Teen Empowerment, we've set up a program where we bring youth from Teen Empowerment into the police academy at the very beginning of the, the academy experience to get to know the recruits. And then we also bring them back at the end of the academy experience just to sort of gauge how that relationship has grown and how their perceptions of the people that they're dealing with on the street has changed. So, um, you know, efforts like that and strategies like that, continuing to develop things like that will go a long way towards bridging that gap and taking it out of the realm of simply law enforcement and putting it into more of a community approach. Let's stay with that for a moment because there's certainly many who believe they have that whole an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. The police department budget has about $2 million a year mark for school resource officers mm -hmm. and other youth engagement programs. Are there any aspects of youth engagement that need to be uh, filled that, that aren't out there yet? I, I think of a time where used to hear of police athletic leagues and 
cops coaching students and athletes and young adults and young children. Does that still occur today? It does still occur, and I think the, the, the benefit of this whole thing is that not all of it costs money. Um, for example, we do Project TIPS. Project TIPS is a program that's run through Camp Good Days and Special Times, but it involves us going into the community, literally going door to door and speaking with the residents of a specific neighborhood, and then inviting one everyone back to a park where we're cooking food and hamburgers and hot dogs. We have a DJ that's out there playing, and the youth get out there and interact with the officers and playing kickball and, you know, efforts like this. Now, does that cost a little bit of money? It does. Um, that money generally comes from Camp Good Days and Special Times, so it's not impacting the law enforcement budget or the RPD's budget. But it's a minimal cost, but it, it reaps huge benefits for the connections that are made by the officers and the neighbors there. Mr. Mazio, we put a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of the communities, the affected communities, and law enforcement. Is there a role for the rest of us, media, private industry, faith-based organizations? Absolutely. I think it's part of the neighborhood. You know, I listen here and I hear things that we're doing and we're, all of these are good ideas, but what are we doing? We're trying to rebuild the neighborhood. You know, the neighborhoods used to be made up of the church, the school, the police station. I think that's what we're trying to do and I, I disagree in one sense with you that I think we can go back. I think we can go back to maybe a better time or where we saw less violence and we saw better neighborhoods and we saw more interactions because I think that's part of the problem. We don't interact anymore like we used to do. And part of that is because we've separated from the neighborhood and specifically with some of our services. You know, the mayor's initiated getting back into the neighborhoods with our police stations. We accept that we're behind that 180%. We started, we haven't got all the way there. That's what needs to be done. We need to be back and part of the community. Madam Mayor, everything has a cost. Mm -hmm. Sadly, you don't have an unlimited budget. Right. And there is a cost to taking cops out of cars, putting them on foot, <coughs> putting them on bicycles. But is there a trade-off? Should we have more law enforcement in those communities, as Mr. Mazio said, so that they, they're a familiar presence and not there only when responding to a 911 call? <coughs> Well, we, we agree with that, and that's the reason why uh, when, we, when I came into office, we went back to a community policing model, going back to a five-section police model, and we are in the process of doing that. We, we, have, uh, we set it out in stages to actually reorganize first, and then now we're evaluating locations to do just that. I think that when you think about the cost of not doing that, you know, for many years, you think about for at, at least 10, 10 years, it was really a uh, a method or a strategy of just responding to calls, not necessarily building those relationships. And because of that, you've had this relationship deteriorate over time. And now it's time to really rebuild that relationship to go back to working together. Because one thing's for sure, the police department isn't going anywhere and the community is not going anywhere. The faith community isn't going where, anywhere. Government is not going anywhere. So we have to find a way to exist cohesively, respectfully, and also in a way where we can lift each other up instead of tearing each other down. And of course, on the other side of that, and, and what the mayor was alluding to, is we've seen protests across the nation dealing with what's transpired with encounters that have gone sideways between law enforcement and the public. 13 Wham's Doug Emblidge has more on this. July 2016, downtown Rochester. The national spotlight cast on the East End as the Black Lives Matter movement convenes. Streets blocked, tensions rise, police march in. People have their hands up in the air right now. A dramatic demonstration lasting for several hours, aired on live television. Demonstration unfolding just hours after the tragic events in Dallas where five officers were gunned down in the line of duty while protecting protesters in that city. The Rochester protest would end with more than 70 people arrested. All the charges later dropped. Police defending their actions, saying the fact that there were no serious injuries is a sign of success. 
And we're joined now by someone who is no stranger to the whole issue of protests and setting those up. Uh, let's go to a protest organizer. Chanel um, Sneed is joining us. Chanel, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Definitely excited to be here this evening. Well, you know, you have an interesting perspective on in all this because your dad was a police officer, and yet you said you have seen, you've witnessed injustice yourself. So you must have some struggles there as a daughter of a cop, but you've got concerns about what you've witnessed. Can you talk about that for a moment? Um, definitely. One thing I, I do want to say kind of before we go there is just to address something that one of the panelists said. Um, it, it kind of questioning whether um, when we can get back to a time when we value lives. And I do want to just make it very clear that black people have always valued other black people. We've always seen value in each other and we still do. Um, I think that that's a historically inaccurate question because we know with 200 years of slavery um, and then go, moving into Jim Crow and, and moving into um, just the 1960s and the, and, um, the civil rights era that it's been the American government and white Americans that don't value black lives. So when we ask these questions, well, where are we going to get back to a time? We have to realize that we're still trying to get to that time. Um, but now I'll go into the question that you did ask. I just wanted to make that very clear. Um, it's, it's been a very interesting uh, past two years. Um, I started organizing with black in 2014. And yes, I did grow up in a, a home with police, with, you know, my dad being a police officer. Um, but at the same time, like my brother's been pulled over in gates with drun guns drawn on him um, over the minor things. So it's like either way, I'm still a black woman. My dad is still a black man. My brother is still a black man. So um, that uniform comes off at night. It doesn't stay on. So whether or not you are a, a doctor, a lawyer, a police officer, you still have an opportunity. Um, the, 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 the stage is still set for you to still be black in America and be affected by police brutality, oppression, and white supremacy. And I want to bring the Reverend back in the conversation for a moment because I don't want to put words in your mouth, Reverend, but I, in order to give you a chance to clarify, mm -hmm. I think when you talked about the devaluation of life, you weren't limiting it to one community or one race. Did you not say it's a problem afflicting everybody? Let me say this, that between 1980 and 2015, 325,000 black lives have been lost at the hands of other young black males. Now, people can disagree with that all they want, but there are some sectors in the black community where some folk don't, don't value black lives. So I am saying, being prophetic as I am, that black people must value other black lives to put an end to the killing that are going on in our community. You cannot go back to the past. I'm sorry, Mike. You know, I don't want to go back to the past. I want to deal with the present and put strategies in place so I can forge a new future for everybody. Second thing I want to say is the fact that we need to look at the fact that police community relations over the years are in crisis and have deteriorated to a new low. So the question is, how do we transform the, the, the culture of policing and begin to build trust and legitimacy. We had a summit on October 26th in which nine to ten law enforcement agencies were there and they interfaced with people from the faith community and other uh, uh, community representatives in order to look at how we can achieve uh, uh, changes not only in the community, but also in policing. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier was the fact that we need to stop the flow of guns into the community. And, and, and it's gonna get so worse that we can say, well, we need to stop the flow of knives into the community. But, and I don't mean to make that a laughing matter, but it's a very, very serious issue that we have to grapple with. And the young lady is correct, that we've had to put up with centuries of, of, of oppression uh, based upon white racism. We've got to deal with structural racism. Uh, I, I, I think that with the, the new president-elect, 
we're going to be facing much more darker times ahead uh, because of the fact that he is loading his cabinet with, with people with right-wing policies. So I have a problem with that. So the point is, is that we have to look at how do we make policing more effective? How do we get police officers not to be seen as occupiers of the community, but as guardians of people's civil liberties and civil rights? Ms. Snead, I'd like to bring you back in the conversation. A couple years ago, you were instrumental in helping found a group building leadership in community knowledge. And I was troubled by something you had said some months ago in referring to your organization. As a journalist, I enjoy the benefits of the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression. But in referring to your organization, you wrote, initially our group began weekly meetings to provide a space, a safe space for people's voices to be heard. What are the concerns you have? Because it troubles me that you would feel uncomfortable being able to express yourself. What were the problems you faced? What were the dangers or threats or concerns you had that you felt you couldn't speak freely without having some kind of repercussion? Um, I didn't quite hear the first half of the question. Um, well, you, can you, you said you among the me? reasons why you launched the organization was you needed a safe space for you and your fellow members to be able to discuss issues of importance to them. And my concern as a member of the public is why should you feel threatened? What were some of the concerns you had? What was happening that you couldn't feel safe enough to voice your concerns? Um, well, one of the things that, that as a, a minority in this country, but you know, understanding that we're a majority in the world, is that um, we don't always have time to just be around other black people, um, whether that's at work or at school. Um, and and it, it's different for everybody, but it just means that you're not, you don't walk around in this country and you're just around other black people where you can speak about issues that plague our community, um, different ways that whiteness and, and um, white people affect how you move through the world. Um, also, just we needed to create a space Space that was safe um, uh, to speak about how we can build. Um, those conversations don't happen in, in front of everybody and they don't happen around everyone. Um, but we also, like, that was the intent of that space. Um, there's no racism, no sexism, no homophobia, no transphobia, no fatphobia, no ableism, no hate. Um, so we have to, you know, build a space as well where we can educate each other and make it safe to where if you do say something that's ableist, which is, you know, uh, something that is putting down someone with disabilities, that you're safe to say it in that space and also be corrected in that space. Um, if you do say something something that is transphobic, um, you're going to be corrected and, you know, we're going to lovingly do it, but let you know that that's not okay to say. Um, I think just as black Americans, like there's a need for safety. Um, it, it, it just is what it is at this point. Um, we've seen, you know, videos and we, we hear stories about the black experience in America. And so there's always going, like in the present system, there's always gonna be a need to have spaces that are void of whiteness where we can just be free and be black. Mr. Mazio, it certainly it troubles me, and I suspect it troubles you as well. Going back to Ms. Sneed's comments, she shouldn't feel afraid. She and her friends shouldn't be concerned about having a peaceful, legitimate conversation in which there's disagreement, differences of opinions. What do we need to do move, to move forward as a society so that people can have those disagreements in a polite and respectful manner? <laughs> that's, that's a tough, uh, tough question, tough answer. I, I, I think we have to interact better. We have to communicate better. And we have to begin to have trust. Um, with the uh, protests that, that night down on East Avenue, you know, prior to that, as a labor organization, we were reaching out into people that we have alliances with, other advocacy groups, to try to get information, to try to share information, to make sure they had the ability to have that demonstration peaceably, um, to make sure everybody was safe those uh, that were taking part in that, and also the people yeah, that had um, to guard the people that were taking uh, a part of that action. That, that was right on the heels of what happened in Dallas. Our biggest concern, obviously, was for the safety of everyone. Uh, and that, that, that's what, I think, put that protest in Rochester into a certain light that hadn't existed before. It was from that aftermath of Dallas. 
and it was a difficult situation. And it was difficult just reaching out and having that conversation because there seemed to be a wall of mistrust or lack of communication. And we worked behind the scenes with the command post trying to relay information. I think there was a common goal, especially with what happened in Dallas. How would we do it better? Uh, that's the that's the big question. And I think uh, we just have to go and try to do it. We have to interact, we have to engage, and we have to give a benefit of doubt to each other, which is lacking, in my opinion, uh, right now. We are quick to rush, to judge, and not to give benefit of doubt to anyone on either side of whatever spectrum you're looking at. A lot of great conversation here with our roundtable guests as well as our live guests. I'd like to know what our audience at home thinks about all of this. Matt Malloy has been manning our digital desk, and he's kept an eye on what they have to say. Hey, Matt, what do you have for us? Yeah, Mark, a lot of viewers weighing in on Facebook as we broadcast here on Facebook Live. I want to give you a question which either the mayor or the deputy chief could answer here. This is from Erica McCarthy, who wants to know how you're going to handle the mistreatment of people of color. That one coming from Erica uh, on our Facebook Live conversation. Mayor, you want to start with that one? I can. I, I think that we have been working very, very hard here in the city of Rochester to repair the relationships between communities of color and our police department. One of the reasons why we get, went to the community policing model and the five section model was to build that relationship. One of the reasons why we put in more officers on the streets is so that we can build those relationships between the, the community and the, the police department that they serve. When we talk about different training models and what we're doing in the academy and bringing not only our teens but our clergy and our families community as well as the community at large into our training um, classes so that our officers get a chance to interact with them before they go out and interact in, with them on the streets. Um, doing more around um, around cultural competency, diversifying our police department. I have, uh, since I was city council president, gone out to churches along with the chief at the time uh, and even now with other officers in the chief to recruit um, more officers of color, not only uh, African Americans, Hispanic, Asians, so that we can and, um, make sure that our department reflects the community that it serves. The reason why we're doing this 90 uh, days of community engagement is so that we can hear from the community what they feel is the best way that we can repair those relationships that have been, you know, broken. Um, you know, at, at a certain point in time in the city, you know, we were in a mode of really just law and order, just trying to do law and order. And we're trying to go back to a place where it's about really protecting and serving. And I think that when we talk about um, having, and I believe that Rochester is probably the only city that has a deputy chief that's dedicated to community engagement, dedicated to building that relationship, dedicated to working not only with our community, but also with the men and women that are in our streets patrolling and, and keeping the city of Rochester and trying their best to keep the city of Rochester safe um, and getting their intake on this. Um, it's, it's, it's all about the fact that we have to do this together. It is not an adversarial relationship. It has to be a part partnership because we all have to understand that this is our community and we're going to be here and where we need our police department because what happens is when something happens in our community what do they do they pick up the phone they dial 911 and they know what they they expect they demand that an officer comes and that officer goes. When they come, you want the, the community wants that person to be respectful, to understand their challenges, to understand what they're going through. We, we know that and our goal is to improve and to get better. I'm not going to sit here and say that we have um, been right 100% of the time because we haven't. But the thing about it is I think that we all can say that we try our best to do the right thing and when we don't, we evaluate that and try to improve upon that. Mayor, thank you very much. We want to remind people on Facebook Live, the conversation does continue there. We'd like you to weigh in with your comments and questions for our panel. For those of you watching right now on The CW, we are going to take a short break, but we will continue live on Facebook Live. So for those of you on The CW, back in a moment. For those of you here on Facebook Live, we continue the conversation right now.